Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's event. We're launching and celebrating the beginning of the exhibition, Jewish Resistance to the Holocaust. And uh, I am delighted to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Dr. Toby Simpson, and I'm the director of the Bina Holocaust Library. This is our first exhibition opening since the lockdown uh, closed the library's doors for the first extended period of time since 2011, when the institution moved from Devonshire Street to Russell Square. And that's approximately when I joined the institution. And uh, it's been quite a, a, a strange experience over the past few months, but the library has always shown incredible resilience in difficult times. And our response to the pandemic has been uh, no different. Uh, our staff and our supporters have pulled together and come through with remarkable success. There's been a heartening feeling of solidarity and that gives me immense confidence for the future. As does the in interest shown in this exhibition, which had, uh, has had some fantastic features in the press, including in The Guardian. And uh, the pre-booked spots for the exhibition have already uh, booked out for August. And we're looking at how we can accommodate the, the demand to visit the exhibition, which is, which is again, very heartening and confirms if we needed any further com confirmation of the relevance of the subject matter of this exhibition, but also of the library's mission more broadly, which is more vital than ever in the, these difficult times. We're holding the event today some hundred years after the first political publication of our founder, Alfred Wiener, and I thought that might be a good thing to mention just in terms of uh, the broader context of this exhibition. And also for those of you who, who may not know of the Wiener Holocaust Library, it was founded in Amsterdam in 1933 and is Britain's largest um, collection of material relating to the Third Reich, the Holocaust, and now also other genocides. Um, but its roots go back to the work of Alfred Wiener in Berlin uh, during the 1920s. And uh, I, that's why I thought I would mention this remarkable pamphlet of 1919, which was entitled Prelude to Pogroms. And Wiener, having returned from uh, fighting in the First World War, uh, was deeply concerned by the rise of anti-Semitism in Germany. And in this pamphlet, he raised the alarm, specifically pointing out the deliberate stoking of anti-Jewish hatred among uh, industrial workers and former soldiers in far-right parties. Um, Wiener was deeply concerned, especially about the threat this posed to, um, to the fragile, democracy in, in Germany, and he, he showed incredible foresight in recognizing the dangers of anti-Semitism in Germany. And while parallels to the par past should never be lightly drawn, it's sobering to reflect that today, 100 years on, in the midst of a crisis, we witness groups and individuals who are clearly determined to fan the flames of anti-Jewish hatred. So, working at the Wiener Library, part of our continu continuation of Alfred Wiener's mission is showing the terrible consequences of that hatred, um, but also showing the courage of Jews and non-Jews, including Bina, um, in fighting this hatred um, now, and also highlighting the work that is happening today. A new translation of Bina's pamphlet by uh, Ben Barco, the previous director of the library, is to be published for the first time in English next January as the first release of an exciting new publishing partnership between the Wiener Holocaust Library and Granta Publishing House. And I think that again shows the vitality of this institution. So to this exhibition that we're celebrating tonight, Jewish to resistance to the Holocaust starts from the premise that there is no single perspective that can capture the extensive and diverse evidence of Jewish resistance. Ranging from the poignantly refined diaries of Philip Manis in Theresienstadt ghetto, to the haunting photographs of Mendel Grossman in the Lodge Ghetto, to the vivid eyewitness accounts of armed resistance groups from Belgium to Belarus, the collections on display in this exhibition are truly remarkable in their breadth and their depth. They also include items that sought to communicate a message, uh, showing defiance, um, uh, and also there are many collections on display that are intensely personal that show an incredible determination to survive and to resist the genocidal aims of the Nazi regime. One such moving item is actually the diary of Alfred Wiener's daughter, Ruth, who survived Westerbork and Belsen along with her sisters. The exhibition examines Jewish resistance across multiple places and contexts, 
in the camps and ghettos, but also elsewhere from forests to attics, sewers and city streets. It urges us to listen closely to the voices of those who resisted and it does not yield to the temptation to impose a heroic narrative on the history from the outside, which might only serve to silence its complexity. Uncomfortable truths are inherent in these stories, not least because Jews were often forced to undertake quiet but incredibly brave acts of resistance as part of their own fight for dignity and their own fight for survival. We hope this exhibition will give people a fuller understanding of the variety and the profundity of Jewish resistance to the Holocaust in its many forms. So I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. First, we will hear from Dr. Barbara Warnock, who is our senior curator and head of education. A Jewish resistance to the Holocaust is the latest of several outstanding exhibitions that Barbara has curated or co-curated since joining the library. Um, some other examples include Forgotten Victims, the Nazi Genocide of the Roma, and also uh, Gerti C Berlin, London, the lost photographs of Gertie Simon. After Barbara, we'll be hearing from uh, one of the library's patrons, Rabbi, Rabbi Baroness Julia Neuberger. Rabbi Neuberger is a crossbench member of the House of Lords. Until 2019, she was senior rabbi at uh, West London Synagogue and Bloomberg Professor of Divinity at Harvard University in 2006. Rabbi Neuberger was the chair of the Commission on the Future of Volunteering and the Prime Minister's Champion for Volunteering. She's a former CEO of the King's Fund. She was vice chair of the Mental Health Act Independent Review and chairs University College Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. After Rabbi Neuberger, we'll be hearing from Professor Samuel D. Cassell. Professor Cassell is the Charles Northam Professor of History at Trinity College, Connecticut. He's the author of Who Will Write Our History? Emmanuel Ringelblum, The Warsaw Ghetto and the Oineg Shabes Archive the acclaimed study of those who worked in the Warsaw Ghetto to collect and preserve records of ghetto life. The New Republic said of who will write our history, this may be the most important book about history that anyone will ever read, which is a great compliment. And so we're very much looking forward to hearing from all of our speakers. But to kick us off, we'll be hearing from the curator of the exhibition, Dr. Barbara Warnock. Barbara. Thank you, Toby, and thank you to all who are watching tonight and to the other speakers. I'm just really sad that you can't all join me here in the library um, tonight in person. I'm in our reading room. The exhibition uh, space is, is below me. So I'm just going to talk to you a bit, bit tonight about how the exhibition came about, our thinking, and also some of the collections that we've used in, in putting the exhibition together. So the exhibition came about partly because Jewish resistance to the Holocaust is not a subject that is actually all that much known about. When people think of anti-Nazi resistance, they often tend to think of the French underground and not necessarily know that there were many in Jews involved in that resistance effort. They may not know, for example, that the most active guerrilla group in Paris primarily comprised Jews. But that is just one story and we wanted to show the range and the breadth of Jewish resistance to the Holocaust across German occupied Europe, often occurring in the most difficult imaginable of circumstances, from forests in Belarus to sewers in Lvov, from death camps in German occupied Poland to cities in occupied France. A further motivation for staging this exhibition, as Toby has um, referred to, is that the Wiener Holocaust Library's collections on the subject of Jewish resistance to the Holocaust are so rich. Our collections include photographs of Jewish partisan groups in the Soviet Union, diaries and journals from inside ghettos, and Toby's mentioned the examples of Ruth Wiener's um, diary from a camp, but also Philip Manus's diary from uh, the Theresienstadt ghetto. We also have a remarkable collection of eyewitness accounts by or about resistors. The Wiener Holocaust Library's documents give us the perspective of the resistors themselves. Included in these accounts are one from Philip Muller, a, son, a surviving Sonderkommando at Auschwitz, and in his account given to the Wiener Library, 
he um, relates the story of an aborted mutiny in Auschwitz. We also have in our eyewitness accounts collections, descriptions from Auschwitz survivors of the actions and fates of resistors who did not survive, like Marla Zimmetbaum, Rosa Robota and Alla Gertner. We also have some very vivid accounts by the few surviving members of the Baum group in Berlin who launched an arson attack on a Nazi exhibition, and also accounts by survivors of hiding from the Nazis underground in Berlin and Vienna, using false papers in Brussels and Amsterdam. One remarkable account tells the story of a child, Norbert Gottlieb, who escaped the Peshemish ghetto as his mother was being arrested. Gottlieb survived for a time in a cavity under a pile of potatoes before being rescued by the Red Army. He was later reunited with his surviving brother Ludwig in London after the war, and the brothers gave us an account of Norbert's experiences. The library has a particularly strong collection of documents relating to the very determined Jewish resistance efforts that occurred in Belgium, not previously seen in public before this exhibition. They include remarkable stories of the mainly migrant Jews in Belgium involved in armed resistance in the partisan army, for example, such as Rauchle Kopperpak who worked as a courier transporting information between different parts of, of the partisan army. We also have a lot of material relating to rescue efforts, including documents by the organizers of the Committee for the Defense of Jews in Belgium, Harva Groschman and her husband, Geert Josper. And they created an extensive bureaucracy for forging papers, ration cards, and other documents and a network of hiding places for Jewish children. Ida Sterno worked for the committee and in her account given to the library in 1957, she tells of how she placed some Jewish girls in a Catholic orphanage for their own safety and then worked with the nuns there and partisan fighters to protect the girls when the Gestapo closed in on them. These stories of defiance, tenacity and humanity in the face of Nazi destruction are inspiring, but we should not forget that many of those involved in the resistance did not survive, such as Philip Manis, Manis deported from Theresienstadt to be murdered in Auschwitz. Marla Zimmetbaum also killed there um, and, whose stories of, or, and whose stories of whose life are preserved in documents at the Wiener Library most of the Baum group in Berlin and the Jewish guerrillas in Paris. We hope that you will be able, despite all the restrictions at the moment, to make it to see the exhibition and find out more about all these stories. Um, there will also be a catalogue available um, in a few weeks um, to buy. But finally tonight, I want to give thanks to Toby and to other colleagues who've assisted me on this exhibition, including Lara Sabir Hawkins, Christine Schmidt, Martina Ravanian, and Elise Bath. And also to our volunteer translators who've translated some of our eyewitness accounts of Jewish resistance to the Holocaust into English for the first time for this exhibition. Thanks also to our wonderful designer, Kate Pettit, who worked so hard to present this rather content heavy exhibition in a beautiful and accessible way. And thank you to the catalogue designer, Stephen Morris. And as I say, um, we will have a catalogue available to buy if you're not able to make it in, which we hope you are, um, to the exhibition in a few weeks time. Um, so that was all I wanted to say tonight. Thank you once again um, for being here and we hope to see you at the library. Thank you, Barbara. I'd like to congratulate you once again on, on curating a fantastic exhibition and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody's responses. So um, next we'll be hearing from uh, Rabbi Baroness Neuberger and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Rabbi Neuberger is a patron of the Wiener Holocaust Library, which is a fact of which we're immensely proud and I'm uh, very much looking forward to hearing your reflections on the opening of this exhibition, Rabbi Neuberger. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to join you and uh, very proud indeed to be a patron of the Wiener Library. And to some extent, of course, this is 
a bit of my story, or at least of my ancestor's story. My mother was a refugee from Nazi Germany. On my father's side, some of them came before the First World War to Britain, and others were rescued. And my grandmother on my father's side was deeply involved in the refugee committee. So this is partly my story. And that's really why I wanted to be a patron when I was invited. I couldn't have been more thrilled. And I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be taking part tonight. Uh, and I also want to say a big thank you to everybody who's organised the exhibition, to Barbara and all your colleagues, uh, and to you, Toby, for everything you've done. And I want to see the exhibition. One way or another, I'm going to make it if we, if you know, if there's any space. But anyway, let me just say a little bit about why I think this is so important. I mean, first of all, clearly, the whole idea of the Vina Library, the archival collection to tell a story, which is an incredibly important story, is... You know, I think that point doesn't really need making, but there, there we are. And it is a, an incredibly strong collection and a wonderful collection. But to have an exhibition like this that talks about resistance and sabotage and rescue missions, uh, partly by Jews, but also often together with non-Jews, I think it's really important because, as Barbara said, quite often you hear people who are very well intentioned towards Jews, nevertheless saying people... You know, they just they went like lambs to the slaughter. It was it was they didn't resist. There wasn't much resistance. They think that Jews didn't somehow fight back. And I think it's hugely important to tell the story of the fight back, a fight back in lots of different ways and to say they did resist and they resisted in a whole variety of different ways and Barbara has mentioned some of those and surely the exhibition shows even more and uh, I can mention just a few there's Tosia Altman in Poland there's the Bielski brothers in Belarus there were the partisans in Russia there were the fighters in the Warsaw ghetto and that's a huge story in itself and Barbara's already mentioned the French mucky the resistance and of course, people forget that a huge proportion of the Maki were themselves Jewish, including, and I think importantly, foreign born Jews, not, not French born Jews. And of course, it was the foreign born Jews that the French wanted to deport before they were even asked to by the Nazi authorities and the Baum group in Germany, who've already been mentioned. And what I wanted to talk about a little bit is a country that doesn't come up much in the Wiener Library because it's not part of the collection, but is hugely important for this kind of story. And that's about Italy and, if you like, the anti-fascist movement that was so led by Jews, uh, particularly the Rosselli family. And Caroline Moorhead has written about the Rosselli brothers, who were, in fact, murdered by far-right people in France before the war even began. But it was their leadership that, if you like, led to so many Jews being part of the resistance in Italy. Uh, Italy where, in fact, there was a resistance that people know relatively little about, uh, but which included loads of Catholic priests, lots of Jews, as I've already said, um, and indeed quite a lot of rather unlikely players, including quite a lot of Italian military and police, and that we know that to be the case. And the reason that's important is Italy is a, a strange story in that when Mussolini started, he wasn't anti-Semitic. Indeed, his mistress was a Jew, Margherita Safati, who was a cousin of the Rosselli brothers who were leading the anti-Mussolini stuff. But what's interesting about that is that Jews were on both sides. You had Jews who were quite pro-fascist and who never believed that any of this was ever going to happen. And the story of Italy is of people who were fascist sympathizers realizing what was going to happen to them and some of them turning completely and becoming uh, leading members of the resistance. There's also a very sad story of you know, how some of them simply couldn't cope. I think it's really important to look at these countries, to look at how people viewed the far right before they realized it was targeted at them. And I think to begin to understand the psychology of what it meant to realize that here was a movement, fascist to start with, Nazi after that, that was really targeting the Jews. And I, I get great pleasure from looking at some of the resistance characters who were sort of incredibly brave. There's a there's a boxer called Benny Bloom in Holland. Boxing was a very Jewish profession. I think we forget that, but it was a very Jewish profession. And he led the first active resistance group in the Netherlands. You meet these people by reading these stories. 
and find these extraordinary people who were not seen as brave before this, weren't seen as remarkable before this, very ordinary people. And one of the things that's so moving about the story of resistance and struggle against this is that very ordinary people become extraordinary by virtue of what they do. And so I think one of the things to reflect on is what was it that made those people be quite so extraordinary? We can't really dig back and tell. We can tell about individuals because we can read some of what they wrote. But we can't really tell about why some of them were just so angry and so motivated to resist and so strongly believed that any form of putting up with it was just not acceptable. It wouldn't make life easier. It would just continue to make life worse. And I think that what we have to say is that these, these people who started ordinary and became extraordinary were people that we have to remember. We have to remember them. We have to recognize what they did. And I think also celebrate what they did. Many of them didn't survive. The majority didn't survive. But the fact that they fought back and the fact that they left a legacy of letters and documents for us to look at now is something that we need to recognize, engrave deep on our hearts and realize that it's an expression of really what is best in humanity. Thank you so much, Rabbi Neuberger, for those incredibly stimulating and wide-ranging thoughts. It made me sort of really struck me what you said about the extraordinary going alongside the ordinary. And uh, it, uh, it really pleases me that we'll ne next be hearing from Professor Kassau, who, of course, is an expert, especially uh, on many things, but especially on the history of the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, uh, we mentioned already about, you know, many people who, you know, if they know anything about uh, Jewish resistance, may know only of the French resistance and an, another aspect of uh, resistance, which is more widely known, of course, is the history of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. But to understand that, of course, you, you need to understand a great deal of the context. And uh, I think some of that comes through in this exhibition. So I'm very pleased that we'll be able to welcome the, uh, to speak now, uh, Professor Sam Kassel, who will speak to us a little bit about his thoughts on uh, the theme of Jewish resistance to the Holocaust. Professor Kassel. Uh, thank you. Can, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Oh, good. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for uh, asking me uh, to speak. Uh, sorry that it can't be in a more uh, direct way. Uh, I have uh, fond memories of, of the library when I was uh, uh, studying in Britain in the late 1960s, and I would come to the Wiener Library often. Uh, and uh, the subject of this exhibit is uh, very close to my heart. My, my mother was in the partisans in Belarus during World War II. She was in the Rokosovsky Brigade. Uh, and uh, my uh, grandfather was on a Judenrat that uh, uh, burned uh, the entire ghetto in this small uh, town in order to try to give Jews uh, a better chance to to escape. So I certainly uh, heard quite a lot about the issue of Jewish resistance as I was uh, growing up. Uh, I, uh, the book that I wrote uh, was, as you heard, uh, about one of the most successful uh, examples of cultural resistance in World War II. The, uh, underground archive in the Warsaw Ghetto, organized by Dr. Emanuel Ringelblum in 1940. Uh, that archive was called the Oynik Shabbos Archive, the Joy of the Sabbath Archive. Uh, it, it was very uh, clandestine. There were many layers of secrecy. And in fact, the archive was never discovered by the, uh, by the Gestapo. Why was this uh, archive so important? And it goes to the title of my book, Who Will Write Our History? The Germans thought that they would win the war and they would decide how or if at all the memory of this murdered uh, race uh, would, would uh, be uh, preserved. Uh, and the Jews in the ghettos having seen German propaganda posters, having seen the German film crews, had a very good idea. 
that the Germans would not only murder them physically, but the Germans would then distort uh, and, and, and uh, undermine their memory for posterity. Indeed, as one of Ringelblum's teachers, the historian Dr. Schiffer said just before he was murdered in Majdanek, what we know about murdered peoples is usually what their killers choose to say about them. But Emanuel Ringelblum in the ghetto said, no, we will write our history. And if we can't, we will at least leave time capsules buried under the ground. So posterity will write our history, not on the basis of German sources, but on the basis of Jewish sources. Uh, and uh, the archive set to work and uh, it, it amassed an enormous amount of material. Now, sometimes we tend to uh, think in a rather false dichotomy between cultural and spiritual resistance on the one hand and armed resistance on the other. Uh, there was one uh, Yiddish writer, Shlomo Bellis, uh, who himself had been a, uh, a uh, decorated uh, soldier in the Red Army, who uh, wrote after World War II that the Jews in the Vilna ghetto, who had uh, established uh, uh, theaters and uh, who uh, were known for the very vibrant cultural life that they uh, created, that uh, the Jews in the Vilna ghetto should not have done that. They should have immediately uh, gathered arms and prepared to fight. That culture, uh, theater, cabarets, poetry, communal singing, all this was a narcosis that diverted the Jews from what should have been their basic task. But others who had fought in the partisans or who had been uh, instrumental in Jewish resistance movement said, no, that's not uh, uh, true. Uh, Yitzhak Zuckerman, who was the assistant commander of the Jewish fighting organization in the Warsaw Ghetto said that had we not spent two years uh, studying Jewish history, uh, 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 going to ghetto theaters, reading poetry composed in the ghetto, we would not have been able to have protected our inner psychological resilience, which was so necessary for then proceeding to the organization of armed resistance. And in both the Vilna and the Warsaw ghettos, there was a close collaboration between those who uh, ran the archives and those who were involved in the resistance movements. So just to repeat myself, you could fight uh, not only with guns, you can fight with pen and paper. It was said that the great Jewish historian Shimon Dubnov, just before he was murdered in Riga, yelled out, Yidin Fashreib, Jews write everything down. Uh, we found buried under the ruins of crematorium number three, a bottle stuffed with the writings of members of the Auschwitz Sonderkommando. We've, we found uh, literally dozens of diaries buried under the ground. Uh, there were organized archives in uh, many ghettos, including Ludge and uh, Bialystok. But uh, the Oynik Shabbos was the best organized of all the archives. It had the most ambitious agenda. It collected artifacts and writings. <clears throat> it commissioned a study of the Jews under German occupation. It documented the progress of mass murder. It interviewed survivors who'd escaped from death camps, including Chelno and Treblinka. It sent four reports to Britain via the channels of the Polish underground. And so in fact, it was a basic part of the overall resistance movement in the Warsaw Ghetto. On March 1st, 1944, Ringelblum wrote his last letter. He wrote it to a friend of his, Adolf Berman, and in this letter he said, if none of us survive to the end of the war, 
what will happen to the Oenix Shabbos archive? And he had good reason to worry because by the time the war was over of the 60 or so people that Ringelblum had gathered around him in this national mission of documentation, there were only three survivors and only one, Hirsch Wasser, knew where the archive had been buried under the Jewish school in the ghetto Anobalipki 68. Wasser himself had survived by the thinnest of margins, once jumping from a train, taking him to Treblinka. After the war, uh, it was very difficult to even begin the search. Warsaw was a heap of rubble, but the search began. And on September 18, 1946, they found part of the first cache of the archive buried in August, 1942. Much of it had been ruined by water seepage. Four years later, Polish construction workers found the second cache buried in um, February 1943, hidden in milk cans, which protected the documents much better. And there was a third cache buried a week before the outbreak of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. That was never found. That site today is where the Chinese embassy in Warsaw is. And perhaps someday that uh, those documents might uh, 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 come uh, to light. So much has been lost. Nonetheless, we have about 35,000 documents from the Ringelblum archive. They've just been published in book form in Poland in 36 volumes. Because of the Ringelblum archive, we, the half million Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto who were murdered by the Nazis were not just anonymous victims killed en masse without names, without identities. Thanks to the archive, we remember their names. We remember them as individuals. We remember them as part of a community. We remember their dreams, their hopes, their fears uh, in the very last months before they were killed. Uh, think, if the archive had never been found, we would uh, have, have had no idea about the internal cultural, political life of the Warsaw Ghetto. We would not have had the very rich theological writings of the Piasechna Rebbe. We would not have had the uh, uh, writings of Ringelblum or, or Rabbi Shimon Huberban. We only would have known about the life of the Jews through the documents of the perpetrators or through a few survivor testimonies, which would have given us a very different picture. And finally, by understanding and by appreciating what Ringelblum did in the Oynik Shabbos archive, we come to understand that when we think about the history of the Holocaust, we should remember that there's no barrier, there's no partition between the history of the Holocaust and wider Jewish history. That the uh, uh, archives makes it possible for us to remember that the ghetto was not just an antechamber to the death camps. The ghetto was a kind of Jewish community under terrible pressure, beleaguered, uh, in many ways distorted and perverted, but nonetheless a community with social space where uh, to some degree it was still open to the pre-war values and the pre-war culture that, uh, that uh, remained so important for so many individuals. And be, the very fact that we could be here today talking about it shows us just how uh, amazing uh, Emanuel Ringelblum's vision was and how ultimately successful uh, 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 Ringelblum's uh, a project uh, turned out to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kassau. Um, we are ever so slightly ahead of schedule. So I think I'm going to offer uh, Barbara and uh, Rabbi Norberger the opportunity, uh, and also you, Professor Kassau, to ask any questions to the an other panelists that you may have. I, I thought perhaps something that I could ask you, Professor Kassau, first is just to say a little bit more about the, the term that you mentioned, cultural resistance, and to what extent you think that that has been uh, sufficiently recognized in the way that people have, have described and discussed and remembered Jewish resistance up until now, or is it relatively recently that that's really been recognized more fully? Yes, I think it's been relatively recent. Uh, 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 the, 
after after the war, uh, the, you might say that the first phase of of Holocaust memory in uh, Israel, and to a lesser degree in the United States, was to kind of uh, emphasize the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, to emphasize the battles of the partisans. Uh, in uh, Israel especially, there was this tendency to uh, look at survivors with a certain degree of embarrassment. Uh, they didn't fight back. They let themselves be led by, like sheep to the slaughter. And therefore it was the fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto, as the partisan who quote unquote, redeemed the honor of the Jewish people. And in that, uh, uh, and, and in that uh, way of, of uh, looking at what happened, uh, cultural resistance was seen to be very unimportant and beside the point. After the Eichmann trial and uh, uh, after the Yom Kippur war, when uh, in Israel there was uh, more empathy and more understanding for what the Jews went through, there was uh, more willingness to appreciate uh, the uh, uh, other ways that Jews resisted the German attempts to, to humiliate them. There's a Hebrew word, amidah, stand up. It's a word which kind of connotes resistance in many forms, uh, creating schools, uh, uh, observing religious uh, commandments, uh, composing songs, uh, and as time has gone on, uh, historians have devoted more and more attention to this aspect of Jewish life in uh, the ghetto. So now we have a rich bibliography of books in English, German, Polish, and of course Hebrew, not to mention the wave of Yiddish scholarship, which appeared right after the war was over and which was largely ignored. And so now we have a real recognition that cultural resistance and armed resistance are not uh, 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 dichotomous, but they're complementary. Mm. Fascinating, thank you. I just wondered if, if Rabbi Neuberger, you wanted to offer any reflections on-, on well, I, I wanted to add to that and, and to say, I found that completely fascinating, Professor Casso. And I wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about, uh, if you like, the cultural resistance and the religious resistance. So for instance, you've got rabbis writing responsa when they're there in the death camps. And when you talk about Amidah, uh, the, you know, Amidah is the central prayer of the Jewish liturgy. And also it means standing up and standing up against all of this so i think there's a i think there's a very uh, deliberate sort of almost an ironic use of amida in, in in that kind of way but i wanted to ask you about why you think that particularly in israel um people were so embarrassed by the cultural resistance given that quite a lot of people who were part of that cultural resistance who survived actually ended up in israel and i'd really like to hear your reflections on that well, one of the problems was that uh, the Zionist movement had right from the beginning uh, said that the diaspora was uh, in the long run doomed and that Jews had no future in the uh, diaspora. Uh, this was a basic tenet of uh, modern Zionism. Uh, therefore, even though uh, Zionists, and of course there were many different kinds of Zionists, but even though they did not predict the Holocaust, nobody did, not even Jabotinsky. Nobody could foresee the horrors that happened. Nonetheless, uh, there was a tendency to uh, look at the Holocaust, and I'm talking now about the 50s, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about later on, but in the 50s especially, there, there, there was a tendency to say, well, you see, what, what happened was not all that much of a surprise. Uh, had the Jews listened to us and, and had they gotten out, had they not listened to their Hasidic rebbies who told them to stay, had they not listened to the Bund who, who, who uh, deluded them with pipe dreams about a socialist Eastern Europe, had they not listened to uh, uh, the assimilationists, uh, had they listened to us, somehow they would have avoided this fate. And while nobody was indecent enough to say, we told you so, you had it coming, uh, 
uh, the fact that so many millions of Jews were murdered uh, was seen by a, uh, an evolving Israeli culture that prided itself on being tough and, 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 on, and, and, and on being uh, determined to defend Jewish honor and able to uh, defend Jewish lives, there is a tendency for that evolving Israeli sabra culture to look at the survivors with contempt. And the songs, the theater, uh, certainly the religious life in uh, the ghetto, this was all waved away as being of very little importance. But now you've had a real sea change. That's no longer the case. In Israel today, uh, uh, one of the most important uh, uh, achievements of Israeli historical scholarship has been in-depth study of the major ghettos, uh, Lodz, Bialystok, uh, Grudno, Warsaw, of, of course, and uh, Polish scholars have also done this. And in those studies, cultural resistance and Amida, meaning self-help, meaning soup kitchens, uh, meaning uh, uh, daycare centers for children, refugee centers, all this has given quite a lot of attention and plays a very important role. Uh, that's absolutely fascinating. It's interesting that we should touch on uh, Israel in the 1950s because the project that Eva Reichman carried out at the library to gather uh, over a thousand eyewitness accounts was in, in partnership with, with Yad Vashem, which at that time was being set up and uh, copies of, of the eyewitness accounts that Eva Reichman gathered were also sent to Yad Vashem. Uh, so I thought it's, think it's interesting to think about also the links between uh, the documentation of uh, eyewitness accounts in the 50s in, in contexts like Britain and Israel and in the United States. Um, I had a question from, from uh, the audience, which I think might uh, be best posed to Barbara, which is, which item in the exhibition really stood out or spoke to you and why? Barbara, would you mind answering that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, there's, I mean, there's, there's so much um, that I could talk about, but I'll, I'll just mention a few things. So um, one item which actually fits with the theme of cultural resistance is that we have um, the original handwritten libretto of um, the opera, The Emperor of Atlantis. And the libretto was by Peter Keane um, and the music was by Victor Ullmann. And not only was this um, composed within Trajan Stat, Stat Ghetto as part of kind of cultural resistance, but it is actually an anti-Nazi, um, anti-Hitler, um, satire. So it's a piece of resistance in a number of different ways. Um, and we are fortunate enough to have this um, incredibly precious document of this original um, libretto of this, this rather sort of forgotten opera in a way, though it's come to a bit more attention in recent years. So that was one document that um, struck me in particular. Um, other, a couple of other things that just and just some of the, the stories that you can find in, in superficially very unpromising looking documents. So, you know, just, just a very sort of boring, tattered looking, um, typed up document from the 50s. Um, but within that, you know, there's there's these little stories of, you know, that I've mentioned a couple of them already, the, the um, rescue of the girls from the convent. Um, in Belgium, the um, Norbert Gottlieb and, and his his story of escape and then hiding. Um, and so I suppose those were other things that really struck me in, in preparing the exhibition, um, some of the little kind of forgotten stories. Um, and I, I suppose this is less from our documents and, and not so much a, an item in the collection, but um, a, a story, other stories that struck me were um, of, of the rare occasions um, in, in um, Ukraine when people were able to kind of mount small amounts of resistance in, in ghettos in terms of um, soup kitchens and things like that, but also sometimes eventually managing to contact um, partisan fighters. And these are very um, unknown about um, and, and, you know, not very documented um, for resistance and so that so those are often things that struck me the kind of less familiar stories or the tiny little stories that you can sometimes find in in historical um documents but um yeah i found, I, I sort of found most of the documents that, and items that um i looked at and that i put in the exhibition um uh, fascinating but those are some of i suppose the things that really struck me hmm. No, there is that the the items from the Theresienstadt ghetto also struck me, and uh, Philip Manners' diaries are, are, are perhaps 
you know, among the most extraordinary items in, in the library's collections. Mm. Um, so I just wondered, uh, again, Professor Cassar, whether um, the also looking at the uh, cultural resistance in, in, in the Theresienstadt ghetto uh, sort of prompted any thoughts for you in, in, in sort of putting it in a parallels with, with the situation in the Warsaw ghetto? Uh, well, we're, of course, no, no two, no two ghettos were uh, alike. Uh, the uh, uh, Theresienstadt ghetto uh, was, uh, to some degree, uh, uh, a an example of the uh, concentration of Jewish cultural energy that had uh, gathered uh, and accumulated in the interwar period, uh, not just in Czechoslovakia, but in Germany and in Austria. Uh, we, you, if you look at the work of scholars like Michael Brenner, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the work uh, of, of, of scholars of Czech Jewry, uh, one of the things you see is that between World War I and, and World War II in these Central European uh, communities, there, there, there was on the part of significant parts of the Jewish population, uh, a deepening interest in uh, uh, Jewish history. Uh, and uh, uh, the Theresienstadt ghetto uh, was able to concentrate uh, a, a a, a, it was people with a large amount of creative and social capital uh, who were then able to play a very significant role in uh, the life of, of uh, the ghetto. Uh, it was, of course, uh, separated. There, there was a problem in the Theresienstadt ghetto in terms of culture. There was a, a sort of a tension between the Czech-speaking Jews and the uh, German-speaking Jews. But within the ghetto itself, uh, what we might call cultural and spiritual resistance played a, a particularly important role. Uh, the, uh, in uh, the Warsaw ghetto, uh, the, one of the problems of, of the Warsaw ghetto was that by and large, the uh, conditions in the Warsaw Ghetto were much worse than, 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 than in the Theresienstadt Ghetto. Uh, the, you, you, it, it was many, many times uh, larger. Uh, a larger, a much larger proportion of the Jews in uh, the Warsaw Ghetto uh, starved to death. And so the whole issue of uh, uh, resistance took on a very different cast. For example, a key, a, a, a key uh, component of resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto, which did not exist in, in the uh, Theresienstadt Ghetto, was uh, smuggling. 90% uh, of the calories composed in the Warsaw Ghetto were smuggled in. Uh, this huge degree of smuggling was not something that you saw in the, in the uh, Theresienstadt ghetto. Uh, so those are just some of the differences. Mm, that's absolutely fascinating to hear your reflections on it. Thank you so much. Um, we did have a question again about uh, um, the, the, the resistance where Jews and Gentiles, non-Jews work together. And I just wondered whether, well, uh, Rabbi Norberger, you, you specifically picked out a, a, a story from, from Italy, which was very striking, but I wondered whether you might want to say a few more words about what, what you, why you wanted to highlight that. I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, obviously Jews were resisting because they were, they were very much under attack, but there were also lots of people who weren't Jewish who felt under attack in not quite the same way, although of course a lot of resistance fighters also lost their lives, but they felt that their whole, their whole value system, their entire moral, uh, moral standing, the enti their entire view of the world was under attack. And I think we shouldn't underestimate that. And so I think it's really one of the reasons that Italy is so interesting is that the resistance was so strongly 
uh, both Jewish and non-Jewish together. But of course, far fewer uh, Italian Jews were deported and perished partly because it started later, but not only. The, the other thing I think it is worth looking at is the Maquis in France, where some people say, I mean, nobody's absolutely sure, but some people say that between 15 and 20 percent of the French resistance, certainly at the beginning, were in fact Jewish. And there's this particular point about the foreign born Jews who the French were trying to deport even before the Nazis had finally taken control. So I think it's really important to, to talk about what what motivated the non-Jews to be part of this resistance. And it's a mixture of philosophy and politics. And it's also a, a, a real sense that what was happening to the Jews was desperately unjust. And you can see that from some of the Catholic priests in, in, in Italy. And that's particularly comforting when you realize that the Pope didn't speak out. But some of the Catholic priests wrote things and we now have them. Uh, Caroline Moorhead's really good on this. But also, you know, the French that they just felt that what was happening to the Jews was completely outrageous, unacceptable, and they were not willing to be part of it. And I think the other thing that's really important to understand about non-Jews who were in, who resisted with Jews, where the, that was very much a, a joint effort, was that it wasn't only about protecting Jews, but that they felt that, that there would be no future for their country if things carried on the way that they, they were going. And I think that, that we we underplay how strongly people felt that their own value system was was being attacked and then i think the last thing it is worth saying is that there were a lot of non-jews who were involved not directly in the resistance around around all of nazi occupied europe but also it sort of helped the resistance particularly with children uh, and I think maybe that's a suggestion for a, another Wiener Library exhibition at some point about the role that Jews and non-Jews in the resistance particularly took um, in trying to rescue children. And there's some extraordinary stories there. Uh, people who were not part, n naturally part of the resistance, but again, lot, often in the church, but you know, when it came to the children, they were just not having it. And I think that that's something that we don't really understand yet. And there are a lot of documents and I think it's worth looking at. Mm. Just Absolutely. to come in there um, and say that, um, whilst I agree with everything you're saying, I think it's, it's also worth um, remembering that the flip side of this is the extent of collaboration that there was in a lot of areas. And, and that in some areas, the situation was um, quite complex with the Soviet partisans, for example, that um, you had Soviet partisan groups that were Jewish, you had Soviet partisan groups um, which Jews were involved in, but Jews did sometimes encounter anti-Semitism in those circumstances as well. Um, and so it's a, a, it can be, I think, a very complex picture um, oh, when you're talking about non-Jews assisting. Um, yeah, it's just a very complex picture, but obviously there were lots of examples I think, I, think, well. I, think, I think it's worth saying that, you know, certainly when you look at some of what we know about the Jews who were involved with the French resistance, there was quite a lot of anti-Semitism mm. there. I don't, I don't think that was unusual. Um, and, 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 you know, there would be anti-Semitism and yet they would work together. And there's some very complex human dynamics in this mm. that I, I suspect still, still could do with quite a lot of exploration. Well, I think that set out very clearly why we thought it was so important to mount this exhibition. <laughs> and uh, some of those complexities are, are precisely what you'll be able to explore uh, when you visit. And we definitely look forward to welcoming you, Rabbi Neuberger. And we hope at some point it might be possible to show it to you as well, Professor Cassel. But we'll be sending you a, a, a copy of the catalogue at the very least. Um, but this has been a, a fascinating and enlightening uh, celebration of, of the opening of this exhibition. Um, it will be running at the library until the 30th of November and for the time being you will need to do a pre-booked appointment to visit so please do go to the Vina Library's website at the following link or you'll find it under the exhibition section. Um, uh, bookings open for August and September um, and we're hoping that more tickets will become available for September soon because we, of course we're uh, uh, paying great attention to um, health and safety but nevertheless we want to make the exhibition as accessible as we possibly can especially given the huge interest in it which is which is really fantastic to see. So I'd just like to conclude by saying a huge thank you uh, to uh, Rabbi Baroness Neuberger, to Professor Kassau and also to Barbara Warnock for uh, curating such a fantastic exhibition. 
thank you to all of our speakers and thank you to the people at home for joining us this evening. Uh, we're very excited to welcome you to the exhibition and thank you for joining us this evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank Good night. You.